give you 32 cents a mile or whatever it was, right? Um, they started uh, doing that quest and said, well, no, the, the route from uh, point A to point B is only uh, 23 miles. You charge 33. I go, well, yeah, because if you take that other route, you're sitting in dead stop traffic. The way I go, I go over the hill and back around, and, it, and I can get there quicker and get the job done. Oh, no, we can't pay you for that. Wow, that's that's ridiculous. Let's see if I get this thing working. I'm already burning up in here, so I was like, well, you know what? I might just turn the damn thing on. Well, you, you do understand what I told you about how they screwed us, trying to screw me over uh, on a regular basis when they, they started that close with it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like they think you're wasting company money and time or something. So, uh, where Clark's at, uh, up in Colorado or something, operating portable or something? Uh, I think uh, David said something about that. Yeah, all the time they, they pre-check your, uh, your uh, you know, your, uh, um, your expense report, you know, and then you gotta do it over again, and then you gotta get signed again, and then it takes longer to get paid. Yep. So is Clark up in uh, uh, Colorado operating portable or something? I don't know if he's on or not. I can ask him. Um, he went on last night. He said there was no signal, so he got off. I mean, I talked to him for a couple minutes, but I could barely hear him. Yeah, he's got his phone in his pocket. Yeah, he's probably going to get back to you here in a couple minutes. Yeah, he's probably going to get back to you here in a couple minutes. David said something about it last night, and I just wasn't sure. I didn't know where the hell Durango was. I never even heard of it. Oh, okay. I didn't know what he was up there doing. Yeah. Uh, I just always think of Durango. I think of Mexico, whatever that, uh, like, that's a, a city there, or is it a county or something, you know? It's like right below Chihuahua or whatever. No, Durango's a, a big city there in the, the southwest uh, of, uh, of Colorado. A uh, real big city, uh, old, uh, old western town. Yeah, but there's one in uh, Mexico too, right? Sure. I guess if somebody was saying that there's uh, pretty cheap land in uh, New Mexico, um, just no work. Yeah, there's no work, exactly. There's nothing out there. I guess if you can, you know, uh, do like ITT, ITT, IT tech, you know, and, and work remotely, I guess you probably have it made. I think just cheap land and being away from everybody else would be good for me, but like I'm getting tired of the weather here myself and just always, you know, sweating all the time and just, you know, and then the winters, you know, I don't mind the winters here, but I just, it's not even that hot here, you know, and the thing is, it's just like, I'm not sure, maybe I'm just getting old or something and I just don't like it or I just don't have any patience or tolerance, but... And I'm, I'm tired of everything being so far, you know, like I have to go drive an hour and a half just to go to Phoenix, an hour and a half to go to Flagstaff, you know, I don't know. But I'm hoping to get out of here eventually. And I hope it's not like the grass is greener on the other side of the fence and I, I move somewhere worse than here, you know. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm sure it is. Um, the guy I was talking to said though he bought like uh, three or four acres on uh, 
a lake or something. He said it's the size of Lake Pleasant. And I didn't ask him what it was, but he said it was really cheap. And uh, he said that he's going to retire out there or something. But, um, yeah, I guess, uh, I don't know. Is there a bunch of lakes in, in New Mexico? I don't think there is. <laughs> yeah, like Cords Lake uh, out here. There is nothing there. Exactly. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I know we want to move. Honestly, I wanted to move to uh, Idaho, but uh, apparently everybody else wanted to also, and so now it's expensive. Yeah, I guess Alaska would be okay. I just got to get through Canada to get there. It's kind of a pain. I mean, I wouldn't want to move all my junk out to Alaska. You know, I had to drive that far. <laughs> Yeah, I think, uh, you know, for the temperatures and all that, yeah, Idaho, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, maybe parts of Colorado, even, you know, Utah, uh, you know, would be cool. Um, but, I mean, for me, I got to figure out, well, okay, well, uh, where can I live where I can work and make good money? Now, uh, Coeur d'Alene is perfect because you could live there and then work in Spokane. Really? That bad, huh? Oh, it was terrible. I mean, it, it, these people look like they came from Orange County, the way they look, dress, and act. Yeah, well, I I think, uh, you know, Colorado, everybody's just like absolutely baked out of their mind, is my impression. Everybody I've ever met from there were like either, you know, stoned or, you know, or something. And just like, I'm like, I don't know if I want to move there. Um, you know, there's, I can't see any reason to go there, personally, but it seems like they're very liberal about drug use there. Well, we used to, like I said, when we were going there, you get off the freeway and you drove like five to eight miles, maybe ten miles to their house, right? And you never pass the gas station, uh, no stores, hardly anything. They, wouldn't, they wanted to go someplace to get in the car, and we would drive uh, to the other side of town, you know, and it'd take us a you know, 20 minutes, a half hour to get there, and then you'd have dinner and go home. And that's, we got off the freeway here, and it's like unbelievable. This is like somebody blew up Orange County right here. It's like all of a sudden, all the stores are there. You need it, it's there. Yeah, I heard that that's kind of what's happening in, like, Austin, Texas. <laughs> right, that's another, that's another place that's supposed to be booming to, yes. But uh, a lot of people are moving to Idaho, but I don't, I don't know if it's as, as serious as everybody says it is. My friend uh, from Oregon bought a house there, and then uh, something happened with one of his kids, got sick. So they, they sold the house, they bought another house back in Oregon, um, but he really liked it, uh, but he said it was also uh, very rapidly growing. And he was able to sell his house for like three times what he paid for it, just in like two years. 
There's a lot of people in California, you know, it's going to take a long time before they all get done moving out. And <laughs> the thing is, as fast as they're moving out of California, there's other people moving into California. So it's kind of, you know, it never, ever ends. Yeah, it won't be me. Uh oh, there's trouble. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. I'll move to Northern California, I don't have a problem with that, but then all the other stuff that I would have to deal with, you know, I don't know if the benefits outweigh the uh, bad things, like, you know, having to pay for expensive tax on land, having to pay for, you know, vehicle licensing and that kind of stuff, and um, I don't know. Is a vehicle licensing uh, more expensive than in Arizona? Oh, absolutely. Well, I think Terry probably could tell you a little bit better because the only vehicle I had licensed in California was a 1993 F-250 and it really wasn't that expensive because it was an older truck. Yeah, the insurance is absolutely double, David. Well, okay, I mean, uh, I like this example. I got a 218 Subaru, and I think I paid $260 a year for taxes on it now. I bet you'd pay 500 there. Probably more. I mean, Washington State is even way worse than Arizona. So, before I moved, I had a 97 Chevy truck, or excuse me, GMC 1500. It was $250 for my tags for a 1500. And that was in 2016 before we moved. It was $250 for my tags every year. And then I had another truck, a 1988 uh, K2500 uh, uh, Chevy uh, Scottsdale or Cheyenne or something like that. You know, is a you know uh, three three quarter ton or whatever heavy uh, half ton, some kind of weird combination. But anyway, they considered it a 2500, 300 dollars for the tags. I just couldn't take the traffic. That would just drive me up a tree. Yeah, it's really bad. My 2000 Subaru Legacy was about 175 uh, for the tags. In Oregon, they were about $80 a year. Eight, no, $80 for two years. Yeah. Uh, Oregon has a thing where usually when you buy your tags, it's for two years. Now, originally in Washington, they voted for $30 tabs, and it was like that for a few years, and then they figured out how to do all this other stuff, and so they changed it. How hot did it get in Prescott Valley today? Um, I didn't really catch the, the high temperature, but I'm sure it was 94 and maybe hotter. Up to 91 here. Yeah, well, it's probably. I think it. I think it was probably closer to 99 degrees here, especially if you guys were 91. 99. Well, yeah, it was when I checked, and it wasn't even at the the peak of the day. I saw 94. I have noticed though the temperatures are kind of shifting. 
like at what time the peaks and everything happen and it seems like it's dropping a little bit more at night so that's kind of a good thing oh yeah i woke up this morning it was like 57. it just kind of sucks because it you know it's it's a little too hot for me to really want to do anything during the day and then as it gets towards the evening you can't do anything because you get eaten alive by the mosquitoes pay you uh you know more than you paid for it but you won't be able to replace it <laughs> because when you go to get a new one there's going to be a thirty thousand dollar tack on that wasn't there before when you bought it originally yeah i mean so they offered me twenty four thousand dollars for it and i i paid uh three years ago twenty five thousand dollars so i mean oh that's pretty good yeah until you till you go buy a thirty-five thousand dollar car that cost you sixty-five thousand. Yeah, I said this picture they had to Clark. I said this picture to Clark. They had a nineteen, a twenty twenty-four uh, Subaru W7 RX, W7 the WRX car, bright red, and it had uh, the off-road package on it. You know, and it was uh, uh, you know standard transmission. It was really a tough looking car, but I thought. Why would you buy a WRX car and want the off-road package? I mean, it's not an off-road vehicle. on offer up and I, I or maybe it was Craigslist I, I said two thousand dollars and I typed in Subaru one after another I pulled up an ad uh, fifteen hundred dollars you know these are like some of them are new like 2014 15 16 17s and 20s um, uh, needs needs rod bearings needs uh, you know uh, has rod knock one after another, I could not believe it. Well, I, mean, I thought the Subarus are more reliable than that. No, no, no. You have to, you have to remember the car just told us about that. There's a four-quart oil system, oil sump system, and the people don't keep an eye on the oil, and they run it down a quarter two, and boom, you got a rod knock. You're done. You're done, yep. And it is real easy especially i think it's because i think it's the configuration of the motor just makes it really easy for them to starve for oil yeah it's a boxer yeah but that, those are the four cylinder ones right i mean because i have the six cylinder it makes no difference they're all boxer engines true yeah, well my 
my comment to the clerk was, well, why don't you put a bigger oil sump on a thing so you can hold more oil so that doesn't happen like most American cars do because they just don't. That's not a good answer. This has been like a known problem for like 20 years, you know, maybe more. And they just, uh, I don't know, they, my, uh, my friend Joe was the manager at one of the Subaru dealers. He showed me a picture in the back room where they had all these blocks that they were stacking up waiting to send back. And they're stripped down, you know. So what, what happens? The engines overheat and then uh, they throw a rod? No, no, they just have a rod knock, you know. They'll run, usually. Sure, you keep oil in it. I always check out the oil. All cars have their problems, all of them. There's really very few that are just like absolutely amazing. Or if they are absolutely amazing, they don't make any kind of power. You know, I mean, there's always a trade off with everything. But it's like they say, what do they say, Terry? You can have three things you can have fast, you can have reliable, and what was the other one? Hondas and Kias, they're really, really bad. Um, Self-consumption, you know, I mean, there's going to be a little bit of, you know, consumption, but it shouldn't be that much. And unless you're, you know, putting lots of miles on, you know, um, you know, or you're leaking, you know, if you're not leaking, you're not going to have to worry about it. Do you understand what I meant, Dave? No, because uh, you double with Bram. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit but um david did you hear what he was saying yeah driving up and down and never checking the oil well also another thing too is certain engines consume oil they burn maybe a quart every three thousand miles but most of them don't but some do like kias and hondas are notorious for self-consumption they've got crappy tolerances in the engine and they consume oil So if you drive your Subaru 10,000 miles every month and you're not checking the oil and you're not changing it, you know, and, you know, if you go 10,000 miles without oil change, you could be down on a quarter or two, you know, and that would be detrimental to a Subaru. But I thought my six-cylinder engine pulled five quarts instead of four quarts. Because they thought it was the four cylinder that only holds four quarts. Um, some of them hold four, some of them hold five, and it doesn't matter if it's the the uh, six or the or the four. They're um, you know, it's not going to make a difference. It's still a small pan on the bottom. It's a very very shallow sump. That's the problem. It's not a very deep pan. The the pan is like on most of them is the size of a, a damn sandwich almost. You know, it's it's tiny. Understand is why isn't Subaru making a hybrid like you know the the uh, hybrid engine because like the like the Toyota and Honda 
they they offer a hybrid, but Subaru doesn't seem to want to go in that direction. Uh, I think because there's not really any profit in it for them. They they sell cars for different reasons, and um, you know, like if you look at what Toyota's doing, they're not really that interested in producing any EVs or any other hybrids, and they're the original hybrid company. They're going to do hydrogen engines, but uh, the United States doesn't really want hydrogen stuff. Uh, but you know, I think that's oil industry related. But the Toyota, they have hybrids, they have that hybrid Corolla, which is supposed to be really like a 50 mile a gallon car. It's all politics, that's what it boils down to, it's politics. Most of us have heard about the carburetors that could get 80 miles per gallon back in the 60s and 70s, and the companies bought all the patents to these things, and people that made cars that ran on water, they magically disappear. Too. Well, you can't disrupt a trillion dollar industry without uh, a little repercussion. Sad but true. I just think Subaru, they just kind of like, you know, they, it's not something that they're interested in dealing with. They, um, you know, they're sticking to their roots, which is kind of admirable, you know, but yeah, I don't think they have a reason to want to do it. Well, Clark was saying that he thought that uh, Toyota and Subaru were going to merge. Well, I don't know. Boy, that'd be one hell of a monopoly. This just in, Chevy and Ford are merging. <laughs> oh no, that would never happen. If it did, all these people would commit suicide. The fanboys would not be happy, Terry. So because they've been making them for a long time and there's there's tons of rally cars that they've made rally editions with a little bit of extra ground clearance and all that so i don't i don't think so it's if it's just a wrx and it's not an sti or something like that i don't really see how it's really going to be collectible WRX is basically the uh, the base model of that. You have the WRX and then you have the STI. And so basically, they don't even have the same stuff in them. The transmission, the viscosity coupler in between the all-wheel drive system is completely different between an STI and a WRX. So WRX is kind of like, you know, it, it could be, you know, it's a turbo car, whatever, you know, it's all-wheel drive versus maybe some of the other ones that look like it called an Impreza, but the STI, that's like the one that, you know, would be worth money. But like Terry said, if they're not going to quit making them, you know, it's just garden variety at this point. I never heard of that. Did you call it FTI or STI? An STI, Subaru Technica International. It's, you know, it's like their SS, you know. I never heard of that one. Oh, yeah, so you see like the... The Impreza WRX STI. And you'll see the little pink label on the back of the hatch that say STI. That that's the highest trim. That's the most expensive one you can buy. It's a sexually transmitted infection. Terry, have you 
talk to Clark today or any uh, text messages? I texted him about this. I mean, so when he texted me back that he was doing something, but I didn't say anything about getting on the radio because it's vacation. I mean, if he wants to get out, you know, he can text me. I don't want to bother him. Absolutely, you're right. Well, there's so much to do up there anyway. arsenic in the water and, and they said but it's okay it's it's acceptable levels and then you know four years later then they start closing things so all the water has arsenic in it here well yeah uh, uh, there's a lot of arsenic in uh, Arizona yeah we could make an Aaron Brockovich movie out of this place yeah so that's what's happening 
person in this area, and we're fighting that uh, uh, we put high density stuff in and let them uh, keep the zoning the way it was for single family homes. Let me ask the old, the old politics, politics thing that uh, we will own nothing and we will eat bugs and all that. If you listen to the lefty talking, the Klaus Schwab of the world, and, and they want us all in, uh, in small homes, uh, rent homes. They don't want to sell anything. Well, you look at Prescott Valley, everything is all duplexes, you know, and then now they, you know, when I first moved here, there wasn't any apartments anywhere. Now they're starting to build three story high rise apartments. Yep. And they don't, they don't want, you know, everything turns into a rental here. They don't, you can't buy a house. I know people that have been trying to buy houses. So they build a new house, it goes up as a rental. You can't buy anything. So their idea is eventually that, you know, all these realty companies will privately hold everything. You know, as people die, they'll buy up their houses and eventually there will be nothing left to do but uh, own nothing and be happy and eat the bugs. Anything is possible, that's for sure. I just, uh, I really don't want to see that, but I mean, you know, what are we going to do, right? Well, we had a, a church camp here that went out to expand from 300 beds to 900 or 1,000 beds. And basically, uh, it was going to, you know, triple the size of the water, and we were going to use more water at their camp than the whole Groom Creek. So uh, people got together and they stopped it. I, I, I'm, I'm totally surprised. Uh, the the, uh, the church uh, group backed down. That's the other thing that amazes me: how there are so many churches everywhere, and they don't seem to be hurting for money whatsoever. a convincing argument. They did own the land, and uh, you know they were arguing that their their church is getting larger and larger, and they needed more room, and they wanted to bring more people up to Phoenix because that's where their church was located. But uh, you know, yeah, everybody signed petitions, and it, it just wasn't approved. And you know, one of the big issues was that the, the, the church camps they they come up here, they bring all their clients in buses. And, uh, you know, we see these buses every now and then going up Senator Highway. And the argument was that, uh, that I think was really convincing is that they tripled their size and went from 300 to 900,000 bids. Then there would be uh, these huge Greyhound buses, or whatever you call those buses, you know, four or five of them a day going up by Senator Highway, messing up the road. Yep. And that road, yeah, that road's um, okay, the road's okay, but a bunch of buses on it all the time, who's it now? Well, what are you residents for? Gosh. Well, the road's not in great shape now. I mean, uh, you know, this winter was really hard on it. And then, uh, you know, you saw that road construction they're doing on it uh, in that one area. They're still working on that thing, I don't know. I thought they were done, and then they're back on it, and they're digging. I, I don't understand them. They, I thought they finished one section, and then they go back to that section three weeks later and, and dig it up again. I don't get it. Yeah, they're putting up this pipeline, uh, and uh, from what I understand. Right, yeah, it was a water pipeline project. I get that part, but I don't get why they dig something up, finish it, and then go into something else, and then go back and dig it up again. And what I don't understand is uh, annexing uh, Prescott Valley, the city of Prescott Valley seems to be annexing property. Can they keep going? Well, they went all the way to the uh, Dewey Humboldt uh, 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 city line. And 
and um, so they, they annexed the property up behind the Blue Hills Cafe. Of course, we're not annexed. The press of country club is not, but the golf course is. And that happened many years ago. In fact, uh, a city council member resigned in a public statement. He apologized to the city, to the citizens of the Prescott Country Club here, uh, apologized to us for, for the shenanigans that went on with the, the country club being annexed by the city of Prescott Valley. The country club, the whole area was annexed? Yes, yes, the uh, golf club the golf course, not the housing around it. Why does Prescott Valley want the golf club, uh, golf course? Well, there was a guy by the name of Halls, family by the name of Halls that owned that, and they wanted to put condos around the golf course. So in order for them to do that, uh, they they had to fight the county. So somehow through politics, they annexed the golf course. This is my scenario the office on it so they could uh, get the council and the planning commission to approve the uh, condos uh, on the golf course. But they never built them, right? Never built them because the house got set up with the legal thing they were going through uh, and they sold it to a, uh, a corporation for those golf courses and uh, there was no plans for them to do anything like that. Even though it's on the planning, the zoning planning. Well, I don't know if you were here when uh, uh, Mortimer uh, Gardens used to be owned by another company. I, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Maybe uh, it will come to me. But they were going to uh, sell it to this other developer, and they were going to put in apartments and housing where Mortimer's is right now. And, of course, that would have been a disaster. If you could, can you imagine that? Yeah, Mortimer, uh, there was some political things going on down there at uh, Highway 169 and 169. That used to be the other, another uh, outfit in there. Uh, I forget the name of it now. I should know it. That was Mortimer took it over. And the reason they, they ran them out because of a the, of the water issue. There's Mortimer's in there growing things out too with water. There is happened and they did the company left and one of them took a uh, I know that yeah I have a friend that's been here for many many years at our church and uh, he's he's uh, been in Costa Valley for many many years about 30 plus more years no use for the uh, city of uh, Prescott Valley uh, politics. Like any city. Well, if somebody wanted to buy a house in this area, where would you recommend? I mean, Prescott Valley sounds like it's getting too expensive. Chino Valley is getting really expensive. with the interest rate going up and uh, the housing market's up. <laughs> it's going to be hard for a young couple to buy a home, single-family home. Maybe they can buy something in Ashford. Yeah, what we really need down here, uh, that property I'm talking about, they want to develop it commercial. I can go for a commercial if they put a grocery store in there. But there's a whole reason club. There's a uh, middle school there. And that grocery store has to be so many feet from a, uh, uh, a school because they sell liquor. Well, that would be a nice thing for you guys, right, to have a grocery store there? Well, yeah. Because the people from there and, uh, you know, all the way to the I-17, they all come up here to Prescott Valley and Prescott to go shopping. They have nowhere else to go. Uh, if they if they could just come up to Dewey uh, area and, and have a nice uh, grocery store, but 
maybe uh, Safeway and Times don't want that because maybe it's going to be some competition for them. Of course, they could do another store, each one of them. Oscar Lima, WK-70.